800 years ago, this man called Timu Yin, and better known as Genghis Khan, the king of the universe, managed to create the largest empire ever known in the history of humanity. It all began in the year 1190 when Genghis Khan managed to bring together the different nomadic tribes of Mongolia in a single powerful army of 200,000 men. This and his undoubted military genius enabled him to conquer vast territories stretching from the Pacific to the heart of Europe and from northern Siberia to India, Iran and Turkey. His armies, relatively small, highly disciplined, extremely well coordinated and with innovative military skill and great mobility, were organized into two mans, a basic formation of 10,000 warriors on horseback. The Mongol hordes lived out in the field and their battle tactics consisted of surprise attacks, charging at the enemy flanks and rear guard before launching heavy cavalry assaults. With the end of the Khan dynasty, a series of civil wars threw the country into confusion until in 1578, Buddhism was established as the form of government under the leadership of Altan Khan. Two centuries later, Mongolia came under Chinese control until 1924, when, with the creation of the Soviet bloc, the country converted to communism and became a satellite of the USSR. With the arrival of the Russians, Mongolia underwent rapid changes, modernizing and industrializing. Buildings, bridges, roads, railway lines, factories and schools were constructed. And the nomads looked on in astonishment as virtually overnight, their country was transformed from a primitive feudal society to the progress of the 20th century. Ulaanbaatar became the new cosmopolitan capital of this renewed country, designed in accordance with the cold and personal urban planning standards of the Soviets. The result is an atmosphere which gives the visitor the impression of having landed in a lost remote city in Siberia. But with the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989 and the consequent disintegration of the Soviet bloc, the Russians left just as quickly as they had arrived. And overnight, Mongolia was completely paralyzed, suffering political and economic collapse from which it has still far from recovered. Since then, the city has rapidly deteriorated and its inhabitants struggle to survive as best they can. The situation in rural areas is also dramatic, and every day hundreds of families arrive in the city fleeing from poverty and hunger. The new settlements which have been established in recent years have doubled the surface area of Ulaanbaatar, and it's calculated that around 40% of the city's inhabitants still live in Gers, the houses of the nomads. But in any case, and despite the great empires, invasions, civil wars, and political and social experiments, in the interior of the country, few things have changed since the time of Genghis Khan. On the vast Siberian steppes, where winter lasts for 10 months, the life of these nomads is virtually the same as that of their ancestors. The horse is still their means of transport, and they continue to live by cattle rearing and hunting. This is the story of three ethnic groups which, though they inhabit the same territory, have different cultures and traditions, but with one common denominator. They are all heirs of Genghis Khan. What this man has just found are dinosaur bones. 
Since Roy Chapman Andrews, whose life inspired the character of Indiana Jones, discovered the first dinosaur eggs in the Gobi in 1921, this desert has become a magnificent laboratory for scientists and paleontologists. With their excavations, they have been able to find answers to many questions, establishing, for example, that the dinosaurs disappeared from the Gobi as a result of avalanches and sandstorms at least 16 million years ago. The most important discovery was made in 1993 when a joint team of American and Mongolian paleontologists sponsored by the New York Natural History Museum found over 100 complete skeletons and a number of fossils of dinosaurs incubating their eggs, some of them with the embryos still intact. And though the majority of these finds are now on display in the major museums of the West, the Ulan Bato Natural History Museum is a magnificent place to find out more about these animals that lived on Earth 250 million years ago. The Gobi is an extreme arid desert covering a third of Mongolia. Traversed by ranges of sand dunes constantly lashed by the wind, the first European to cross it was the Italian traveler Marco Polo in 1275. With temperatures of up to 50 degrees centigrade in summer, which generally fall to 40 degrees below zero in winter, life in the Gobi is harsh and difficult. With the arrival of summer, the nomads of the desert card the wool to make felt canvases, which will protect the gur during the long, cold winter months. It is also a good time to collect and store camel excrement. These animals are essential if man is to survive in these barren deserts. In a landscape where there is not even a single tree, this is the only possible source of energy for heating and cooking. Without it, life here would be impossible. But every year with the summer storms, the Gobi gives a brief respite to its inhabitants. And for a few weeks, the miracle of nature returns to the desert, covering everything with a fresh green blanket of grass. Water once more runs between the dunes and is thirstily absorbed by the parched, cracked land, and the Gobi again comes to life. What until just a few days ago was simply stone and dust now takes on the appearance of a lush garden with all the variety of greens you could possibly imagine. The storks stop off here to regain their strength on their way to the cooler lands of the north, while in the Guramban Saikan Nuru Mountains, the almost exclusive domain of wild goats and scavengers, the ibex descend from the summits in search of food. Wherever it is possible, grass grows and the Gobi is transformed from an extreme arid desert into an incredible, almost surrealist landscape.
Everyone wants to take advantage of this gift of nature while it lasts, and the desert is populated by humans and animals from the high steps which surround the Gobi. In a country where 60% of the population are nomadic cattle breeders, with over 35 million head of cattle, fresh pasture is the most precious commodity of all, and each family will try to lead its herds to the best places. But here the camel continues to be king. It is by far the most valuable animal for the nomads, and has been used by traders and travelers since antiquity. For these ruminants, now is the time to store energy, and their erect humps are evidence of this, an unmistakable sign that they are well fed. If they do not work, they can go for up to 10 months without drinking water, living on the accumulated reserves and losing up to 25% of their weight without suffering any consequence, because the water they lose is only from their body tissues and not from the blood, so the heart does not have to make any additional effort. For over 80 years, the Tenzin Daya family has moved to this region every summer with their 200 horses, 800 sheep and goats, and 200 cows. They continue to be prosperous cattle breeders, despite the fact that two years ago, a particularly harsh winter killed over half of their cattle. The Tassin Daya live in a camp composed of four girls the traditional shelter perfectly adapted to the needs of nomadic life. It is cheap, large, can be put up and taken down very quickly, it is easy to transport, robust, cool in summer, and warm in winter. The girls always face south and the entrance is painted in bright colors to ward off evil spirits. Inside, the stove, which also serves as heating, stands in the center, and around it, the beds, a few pieces of furniture, and most of all, the Buddhist shrine. <laughs> Obviously, the base of their diet is meat, especially lamb. Milk is also an important ingredient of their diet. From it, they produce at least 12 different products, including airag, a drink they make only in summer from fermented mare's milk. This is very healthy and helps combat tuberculosis. They also drink agi, an alcohol made by distilling cow's milk, which they have been making for thousands of years. While the women remain inside the girls taking care of the home, the men get ready for one of the favorite activities of these nomadic herdsmen, breaking in the colts born the previous spring. <laughs> Under the direction of Ninten Basara, the chief of the clan, the riders round up the horses trying to make sure the untamed colts are trapped in the center so they can be caught using a pole. The Mongols never mark their horses or give them names. They distinguish them by their color and have over 200 words to differentiate them. For them, the horse represents much more than simply an animal used for transport and carrying goods, which they began to tame 4,000 years before Christ. Small, fibrous, and incredibly resistant, with great strength, greatly out of proportion to their size, these horses were key in enabling Genghis Khan to create such a powerful army. The chronicles tell us that the soldiers slept on their mounts while they continued to travel through the night. When food was scarce, they even drank the blood of their horses.
At the other side of the country, beyond the desert and the infinite steppes, along the border with Siberia, a vertical world rises up, dominated by taiga. Taiga is a Russian term for the northern forests composed of firs, larches and silver birches, perfectly adapted to the strong winds and the low temperatures. We are in one of the most remote areas of Mongolia. Here there are no roads and settlements are connected only by the paths trodden by the nomads. At the end of the summer, the meltwaters from the mountains cover the majority of the surface of valleys and grasslands, making it extremely difficult to move the cattle from one place to another. For the Dahat, the inhabitants of these lands since the days of Genghis Khan, it is time to transfer the herds from the highlands to less demanding regions where they will spend the autumn. The Dahat can move up to 15 times a year in search of more fertile pastures or places where the wind is less fierce. In winter, however, when grass is scarce, the families must separate and search for food independently. The only boat raft still remaining since the Russians left cannot carry all their cattle from one side of the river Tsangan Nur to the other. But here time is not important, and while they wait, they chant and drink tea. If they cannot cross today, then they'll do so tomorrow. While it is still summer in the lowlands, up in the valleys of the Dokhod Sayani mountains, autumn arrived several weeks ago, suddenly and without warning. The colors of the forest are changing, and little by little the entire range of reds, ochres, and yellows appear. This is the home of the Tsatan, one of the smallest and least well-known tribes in Asia. For these mountain nomads, the essential pillar of their subsistence is the reindeer, but this does not by any means cover all their basic necessities. Their living conditions are so harsh that they are the poorest nomads in Mongolia, surviving on little more than their wits. These people came here from the mountain peaks just seven days ago, and they will spend the rest of the autumn here. It is only at the end of August the first snows appear and gradually the forest is covered in a blanket of white. But for the Tsatan, this is the best season of the year because they are no longer plagued by mosquitoes, the temperatures are relatively mild and there is still sufficient food for the reindeer. The day begins with the milking of their animals. At this time of year, the reindeer are milked twice a day, and from the milk they make butter, a cheese called aurul, cream and yogurt. Smoked meat and wild berries complete their diet. The life of the Tsatan has never been easy, but since the arrival of communism, part of their culture, traditions and daily life have been destroyed. The herds of reindeer, which had belonged to them since time immemorial, became state property. Some Satan preferred to kill them rather than see them disappear. They had to answer to a Mongol official who was completely ignorant of their customs and traditions and forced them to comply with very strict rules entirely unsuited to a nomadic lifestyle. Once they have been milked, the reindeer are released and spend the rest of the day grazing in the mountains.
This settlement, composed of 12 families and 86 individuals, possesses only 200 reindeer from which they obtain just enough to be able to buy a little flour, salt, tobacco and tea. One thing that strikes you is that the horns of all the reindeer have been cut. To obtain extra income, the Tsetan sell them for around $4 a kilo to the Chinese, who then turn them into a powder which is used as an aphrodisiac. While the reindeer peacefully graze up in the mountains, the families remain inside their tents around the comforting warmth of the fire. And that, more or less, is their day. Gombo is the chief of the clan. He was born 55 years ago in the Russian taiga, but when he was six years old, his parents crossed the border and settled in Mongolia. He is married to Sendeli, who is 50, and together they have had eight children, of which only four survive. Their eldest daughter has just had a baby, whose father is a Dahat. This is unusual among the Tsetan, but in these desperate times they must seek to escape poverty, whatever way they can. Until just a few years ago, the women only married men from other clans, but of their same ethnic group. But as they now number just 200, the Tsetan have began to suffer from inbreeding, causing malformations and illnesses. The Mongolian government accuses them of sexual relations between cousins, brothers and sisters, and even parents and their children. Outside, the snow continues to fall and the cold is intense. The youngest chop wood. The fire must not be allowed to go out. The Satan, which literally means the reindeer people, are an ethnic group originating in Russian Siberia, with their own language whose origin lies in Turkey. But with the creation in the 1920s of the People's Republic of Mongolia and the consequent marking of the borders, a group of some 1,000 Tatsan and 6,000 reindeer remained on the Mongolian side. Between chaps and cups of tea around the fire, another day comes to an end. The snowstorm appears to have abated a little, and Dalai Bayar, Gombo's elder brother, takes advantage to go out and indicate to the reindeer that it is time to return to the settlement. When the sun goes down, the taiga will become the domain of the wolves, which systematically attack their herds. The loss of an animal is a real catastrophe for the family economy, which is already down to the bare minimum. Every year, fewer reindeer are born, as the problems of inbreeding also affect them, causing diseases which they transmit to people. With the return of the animals, the camp again stirs to life. Each family separates its reindeer from the herd in order to milk them and give them salt. Then they prepare dinner, a little milk or yogurt, and if they are lucky, some rice. Tomorrow, the same routine. And if the weather permits, the men will go out hunting while the women and children venture into the forest to gather wild fruits and berries. That is a day in the life of the Tsetan, a tribe which unfortunately would appear to be doomed to extinction.
In the Altai range, winter has arrived with even greater force than normal, and at the start of October, a thick layer of snow already covers the mountains. Though we are still in Mongolia, the majority of the people who live in this region are of Kazakh origin. Like the Mongol nomads, they too live in Gurs, but theirs are considerably bigger and much better decorated. Despite the fact the land in which they live is extremely poor, the Kazakhs are prosperous herdsmen, and it's not unusual to find families with 1,000 head of cattle. In this small camp occupied by their Bulgan family, the women begin the day by milking their yaks. But it's very noticeable that there are no men around. Nothing could be more exciting and enjoyable for a Kazakh from the mountains than to go out hunting with his eagle. The season has just begun and for these men today is the first hunting expedition since the start of the spring. And it is a moment they have all been waiting for impatiently. According to an ancient law, the hunting season cannot begin until the first snows of winter arrive, which is normally in the month of October. That way, they give possible prey a respite, so they can breed and raise their young during the summer months. But if the snows take longer than normal to arrive, the hunters all go to see the shamans, to pressurize them into making it fall. They cannot conceive of life without hunting, and in fact claim that when the Kazakhs came into the world, they were already eagle hunters. This tradition, which stretches back over 1,000 years, was inherited by the Kazakhs from their Turkish ancestors, and they were already practicing it when they first emerged as an ethnic group back in the 15th century. After riding for three hours, the five horsemen reached the summit of Balkan Atay, which at 3,900 meters is the highest mountain in the area. From here, they can look out over a number of valleys and nearby mountains. During the hunts, they prefer to move around the highest peaks and rarely launch their eagles from further down the slopes. Meanwhile, the beaters comb the valley, trying to scare out a hare or a fox. But the Altai is also a land inhabited by wolves, an animal very much feared by the Kazakhs, as it frequently attacks their cattle. If a wolf appears, the hunters all release their eagles together, even though they know it may suffer serious injuries or even death. Now, all they can do is to be patient and wait. Fox has left her den, frightened out by the cries of the trackers. With his old binoculars, Kosan does not let her out of his sight. But 
Meanwhile, Altaikan has taken the Tomaga, the hood of his eagle, and it begins to scan the horizon. The vixen continues to flee, desperately seeking somewhere to hide. The eagles of Kumar Khan and Tarek Khan have just spotted the prey and immediately shoot off towards her. Tarekan's eagle is the first to reach the vixen. Tarekan sets off at a gallop down the mountainside in the hope of getting there before the precious fur of the prey is damaged, or before the vixen fighting for her life wounds his eagle. But miraculously, the vixen has managed to get free from the claws of her predator, and wounded runs off trying to escape, but she will not get far. Immediately, Shekin, who up to now has been simply a spectator, decides to go into action and, removing the hood from his eagle, launches it into the sky. The vixen, frightened, exhausted, and knowing that her fate has been decided, decides to give in. Crouching down in a last futile attempt to remain unnoticed, she resignedly awaits certain death. After immobilizing her rear legs, the eagle attacks the head of the vixen, paralyzing it with the tip of its claws, capable of applying pressure of hundreds of kilos per square centimeter. When Talekan catches up with the eagles, the vixen is already dead. Now he must free it from the claws, a by no means easy task. These hunters always use female golden eagles, which they consider to be much more aggressive than the males. With a wingspan of some two meters and weighing seven kilos, they possess two very important qualities when it comes to hunting. Their speed, they can reach up to 160 kilometers an hour as they swoop down, and their extraordinary sight, perhaps eight times as acute as that of humans. With a whistle and attracted by a piece of meat, the eagles return to the arms of their masters. Talay Khan began to learn the noble art of hunting when he was just six years old, and in his family there has always been a great hunting tradition. Kumar Khan, his father, is one of the most respected hunters in the region, and for any family to have a hunter among its members is a sign of prestige and wealth. Only those who own many head of cattle can allow themselves the luxury of breeding and training eagles. In the past, it was a sport practiced in Central Asia only by the elite. <laughs> The Cossacks use nets to trap eagles when they have just eaten and so are unable to fly. For the first month they are kept inside the gear to accustom them to the sounds and smells. Then, for several weeks, they are trained so they maintain their balance on the arm of the rider as he gallops along. Finally, and most difficult of all, they are trained to return to their master after they have been released. From the time they are caught, they always remain close by him 
even sleeping at his side. In the middle of October, this far north, the days become increasingly short, and though it is only two o'clock in the afternoon, it is time to return to the camp, and the hunters set off down the mountainside. The sun rapidly sinks in the sky, and little by little the gentle colors of twilight envelop the peaks of Altai. In the dying light of day, the Kazakh hunters reach the camp where a fine meal of lamb awaits them. But before they can eat, they must feed the hungry eagles exhausted after the first flights of the winter. Kumar Khan, the master hunter, gives them cow liver to eat in a wooden bowl so they won't damage their beaks. Each one of these birds of prey can eat two cows in a single year. Around a dish of succulent lamb prepared in the traditional manner, the hunters give thanks to Allah and without losing a minute start to devour the delicious meat. But tonight is a special night, and not just because they are celebrating the start of the hunting season. Tomorrow, the five friends will set out for Djordjok, a small settlement four days' ride away, where a group of hunters is going to meet for the first time to hold the competition. The rest of the family will pack up camp and move to their winter home. With all the calm in the world and still feeling the effects of the previous night's vodka, Komarkan, Aldaikan, Talaikan, Shekan and Kusan prepare their horses for the long journey. Meanwhile, the women and children will, in little over half an hour, take down the girls. Unlike the other nomadic tribes of the country, the Kazakhs spend the winter in small houses made of wood and adobe in the lowlands, which make the temperatures of 45 degrees below zero, normal at this time of year, slightly more bearable. They are seasonal nomads, that is, they only migrate four times a year, coinciding with the seasons. The five hunters are now ready to set out on their journey. They will ride for six hours a day, resting each night in the gurs they find along the way. If all the nomadic tribes on earth can be said to have one thing in common, then it is their hospitality.
Of the 400 Kazakhs, it is calculated, continue to practice hunting in this region, 72 of them have decided to enter the competition, some of them coming from over 300 kilometers away. A long journey, but then, this is a very special occasion. They all come dressed in their coats called chapan and the characteristic caps of silk and wolf fur, which are called kepesh. The fact is that very little has changed in the life of these Muslim herdsmen since the end of the 17th century when they settled in this corner of Mongolia, fleeing from tribal wars. A century later, after a number of devastating incursions led by a Manchu emperor and which annihilated the Mongols of the region, the Kazakhs gained control of this harsh, extreme land. Today, and because they are isolated by the Altai Mountains and the River Hovd, these hunters have been able to preserve their language, their cultural traditions, and their identity as Kazakhs. A common characteristic among them are the owl feathers that decorate the kepesh, the thin black stripes of which represent the verses of the Quran, a kind of lucky charm that protects them and brings them good luck during the hunt. The tomaga, the hood that covers the head of the eagle, is also decorated with silver incrustations, a sign that the owner is not doing too badly in life. <laughs> In a region as large as Belgium and with just 90,000 inhabitants, social occasions are rare, and so today is a magnificent opportunity to get together, to meet old friends and bring yourself up to date on other people's lives. The atmosphere inside the gaz is extremely animated. Gathered around in many different groups, the hunters recount a thousand and one battles of their days out hunting. After all, though we are in a remote corner of the planet, they are hunters, and we all know what hunters are like. <laughs> With so many people, it's also a good chance to practice cook bear, a very popular game in Central Asia, which the Kazakhs have been playing since time immemorial. Banned during the Soviet era, cook bear has virtually no rules, though in each country it is played in a different way. The Kazakhs compete in pairs, and the entire game consists of getting hold of a sheep or goatskin. At the end, the winner leaves the skin on the ground for the other competitors to fight over. Cook bear is normally played at weddings. At the end of the celebration, when everyone has had plenty of vodka to drink, the bride's father throws the skin onto the ground, and the person that manages to carry it to the gear of the bride's parents will receive a prize, a yak. The difficulty is not just fighting against the other guests. Often the bride's house is so far away that the game can go on for several hours, but a yak is a prize well worth fighting for.
The day of the competition dawns clear and sunny. Since the first light of morning, the participants have been taking up their positions at the top of a hill. A certain nervousness can be felt in the air, and not only because it is the first time that so many hunters have come together to test their skills, but also because yesterday inside the gears, many bets were laid, and some may have bet rather too much. The first part of the competition consists of releasing the eagles one by one on the signal of a pennant towards a fox skin pulled along by a horse. The five birds of prey that take least time to reach the fox skin will go into the final, where this time the target will be a live fox. <laughs> Evening is drawing in and the five finalists are ready for the grand final. Kumar Khan, the master hunter, is one of them. has ended and the participants go to collect their eagles. Kumargan was not the winner but he doesn't mind too much. Next year he will return with his son Talai Khan and his friends to once again share an art and a tradition which he remains alive but which unfortunately in his homeland in neighboring Kazakhstan died out long ago. With no noisy farewells and more or less in silence, the hunters slowly leave Joy Jock and head out into their world of infinite spaces and vast horizons. In the Gobi Desert in the middle of October, the grass is drying. For the Tanzendarya clan, it is time to gather up camp and set off towards less harsh lands in which to spend the winter. The cattle and part of the family left at daybreak, while the rest have remained loading the camels and organizing the caravan. For eight days they will walk, moving northwest to the edge of the desert. Then, at the start of spring, they will travel up into the highlands of the steppe, only to return later to the Gobi. That is what their ancestors did, that is what they do, and that is what their children will do. And that is the story of three ethnic groups that live in a world of constant movement struggling to preserve their most valuable treasure, their culture, which little by little is being wiped out by a society 
engaged in a headlong rush towards globalization.